gentlemen. Uh, I don't want to further delay. I have some technical issues, I have to admit. I want to make it really good. Uh, so from this lecture, we will have now basics and probability theory. Uh, we will also have a so-called live script in MATLAB. So I produced something, you can go through. Uh, there are already some examples uh, implemented. Uh, but uh, right now, I'm struggling from the uh, transition from Mac to Windows. Uh, and so long, I can talk a little bit about uh, uh, less probable things uh, you can get in your life as problems with Mac and Windows <laughs> compatibility. Uh, so we talk about uh, the basic term, and I think it's worthwhile to go uh, back to Adam and Eva uh, and talk about uh, what is a probability. So maybe everybody has already an opinion. So what do you think? What is a probability? How would you describe it, uh, your child or your nephew who is five years old and asks you, uh, what is probability? What would you answer? The chance of happening of something. The chance of happening of something? If I want to say to my, yeah. to my child. Mm -hmm. You? <laughs> so you, you would describe uh, probability as being chance. Or so that's already a very good description. Or frequency. Or frequency. Uh, yeah, that's uh, I mean, interesting. It's, it's different, but you can also say yeah. frequency. Yeah, or frequency or something. Or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, that's uh, actually uh, true. Both is, of course, very much true. So probability is a, is a numerical measure we uh, use to express uh, our expectation that it happens. Right? So uh, in uh, mathematical terms, that's a very uh, awkward thing. Many mathematicians don't like uh, probability theory at all because it's something weird. Uh, but it's actually very, very much, hen uh, it's very handy uh, when it comes uh, to engineering decision making. Because engineering decision making in principle is a kind of reasoning. It's a kind of reasoning uh, based on information. And uh, this engineering decision making is uh, actually going back to the very basic uh, questions Immanuel Kant has in his uh, philosophy. You know, you remember these basic questions he had about reasoning? The last one is uh, what is a human? And the first three are very much related to engineering. Nobody remembers from school? No. That's, of course, a very big topic in Germany in school, you can imagine. Huh? So the first one is, what can I do? Yeah. What can we want? No? Is it the, one now the next one? What can we want? What can we know? What can we rank? No, what can we know is the next one. Ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so what can we do, what can we know, and what can we hope? Yeah. <laughs> That's very much related to uh, engineering decision making. And uh, Kant has, of course, a very nice uh, philosophy. He's talking about uh, rationality and reasoning. And uh, he's uh, talking about uh, the role of information. And uh, very interestingly, at the same time, historically seen, where probability theory was very much in his uh, beginning, or in its beginning, uh, Thomas Bayes developed these rules of uh, conditional uh, probability and uh, how information uh, can be used uh, to update this probability. And that happens at the same time. So it was, uh, it, it was a very interesting uh, development in the, uh, in the 18th century uh, about these concepts. And these concepts are very much uh, adaptable uh, to engineering. So now I have to give you a task, because I have to resolve this finally now. Uh, now you discuss with your neighbor what interpretations of probability do you know and what they are. Of course, I suppose everybody of you has a basic uh, university education in probability theory. Now you have to remember what had been the basic interpretations of probability. But we will uh, more closely discuss uh, three, as a hint. Three different, totally different interpretations. Now you try to remember them and discuss them, write them down, what they are, and then we discuss them together. In the meanwhile, I fix my computer. <laughs> okay, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, now I expect very uh, elaborated answers from yourself. So what are the different interpretations of uh, probability? 
Pardon? Reliability index. Interpretation of probability. Yeah, reliability index is somehow an indication for probability of failure, but still, probability of failure can be interpreted in as different way in different ways. So any other frequentistic? That's one important thing. Another one? You say a physical one, a classical one, which is not only one. The next one comes. So frequentistic, classic, classic, yeah. And I heard the word when I was. Fighting with my computer, <laughs> I heard it already. What was the next one? Bayesian. Bayesian. Extraterrestrial. It sounds. Right? So, what is the frequentistic definition or interpretation? We have to make appropriate number of experiences, mm -hmm. and the probability is effect. Yeah, exactly. Experiments or experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's an effect. An observation we can have from this yeah, so experience. We count special events in the total number of all events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we recognize that. And the classical one was? Uh, we were pre resolving about the, the experience, and uh, we were resolving based on the, the symmetry, for example, mm -hmm. of the experience. And so we are resolving with physics of, of the experience and say that, uh, um, yeah, that, that that's it. That it's, uh, we don't need the. Uh, uh, experiments. We don't need experiments. Uh, that's 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 the two diff uh, important things for the classical definition of probability. We use symmetry considerations of logic and physical reasoning, and we don't need any experiments to say uh, or to make any statement about uh, uh, probability. That's the classical one, and that's very often very helpful. For instance, when we derive probability distributions, we will do that today based on that logic, uh, or which was actually the, the beginning of all probability theory when you want to consult a gambler. Hmm? And you have rules, well, you die about cards, and you have, uh, you, you have rules about these games. And from these rules and from these symmetry uh, considerations, you can deduct the probability of certain outcomes of this game. So very many classical uh, problems in probability theory take origin uh, in this uh, gambling uh, uh, considerations. And then the third one was the Bayesian, who said it? What is that? It's the dating of uh, classical with uh, frequentistic. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, you could say that. It's a definition of probability or a perception of probability as a degree of belief. We have a prior. And not by coincidence, the creator of that was a referent. Who is that uh, probability is degree of belief? Sounds awkward for us, right? We are engineers, we want to make calculations, we want to actually, we want to fight against uh, coincidence, and then somebody tells us degree of belief. And then another guy like me comes and says, that's the way to go for us engineers. Because that's how it is. We have a complex a structure of uncertainties when we deal with problems. It's not only uh, that we can observe a large number of experiments and then deduct our, our frequencies and our uh, uh, reoccurrence rates and things like that. It's much more complex. So when we want to make a statement of probability in engineering, we have actually to integrate information. We have to integrate all kinds of information we can find. And fair to say, large of this large part of this uh, information is frequentistic, comes from experiments comes from well-defined experiments where we make uh, our inference on, uh, but also a large part uh, of information comes from other sources, from not so easy to grasp sources. You might have an experience about uh, uh, historical behavior of some property we observe in a new experiment, and we have to integrate that knowledge about this uh, historical insight about this behavior. I mean, you now start uh, making tests on concrete cylinders. We don't start at zero. We already have an idea what it could be. And we should use that information. And uh, Bayesian statistics makes, uh, makes use of that. Uh, it's also interesting to know that now we come to the structural reliability. And uh, now we make more or less uh, uh, the, the round to that 
because we are very occupied in structural reliability. We are very occupied in the probability of failure of a structure. And uh, I hope many of you have already performed a reliability analysis, even if it was a simple one in, in your lectures. Uh, but what is, what is the character of such a probability of failure? Is it a property of the structure we analyze? Think, think about it. Is this a characteristic of the structure, the probability of failure of that structure? If we would say this is a property of the structure, then we would be frequentists. Then we would think there are thousands of these structures exposed to exactly the same load, and we could make infinitive experiments and deduct on uh, an, a probability from a frequentistic perspective, and we would percept the result of such a thing as a property of the thing itself. So that's actually what the frequentistic uh, perception says, the frequentistic uh, interpretation of probability percepts a probability as the property of something we can observe. Something outside from ourselves, it's something rational. And actually some people in, uh, in, uh, in the research history have been very keen on this argument. For me, this is the most prominent one. He was absolutely keen on the statement that the probability is something that happens outside from us. And then we could say there's a true probability or there's a wrong probability of failure. There's a true reliability or there's a wrong reliability. But as a matter of fact, we cannot do that. We will see in this lecture that all our probability statements all our probability statements of, a, in, of the ingredients of a reliability analysis, the material properties of the loads, of the model uncertainties, they are all conditional. So any probability statement we do, and therefore also the probability statement of our, of our envisaged uh, result, the probability of failure, is a conditional one, conditional on our information. Conditional on our information that is a characteristic from our analysis about the problem. So the probability of failure of a structure is always the property of our analysis of it. That's very important, you should remember that. If you remember only 10% uh, of this course, you should remember among this. The probability of failure, the reliability, is a property of our own analysis, and that is totally consistent with the Bayesian interpretation of, uh, of uh, probability. And that's very, very important to uh, remember. So we lost a little bit of time, so I will go through the introduction here rather, rather fast. I, I did, I did uh, get you some, uh, some background literature. So here is, first of all, my address, so you can ask me questions. Then you have a very nice book uh, from uh, Benjamin Connell. Uh, that's a classical <coughs> one. Uh, that's exactly about the topic of this one and a half hours, and you can imagine in this one and a half hours I will not conclude the topic. This is a very, very good book uh, with, uh, that is written from an engineering perspective. This is actually very rare to find. So, uh, so often you get uh, books on this topic from uh, mathematicians, and that's not so nice to read, right? This is an engineering approach uh, to the topic. It's rather, it's rather old, but it's still a classical one, and it's a very good introduction to this topic. And then we have the... Uh, the book from uh, Michael Faber, you will, uh, when you don't know him, you will meet him on, uh, on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday. Uh, and uh, this is uh, more or less the uh, script uh, he wrote when he was at ETH. And this is also a very good uh, uh, summary of the topic from an engineering perspective. So, uh, uh, Sebastian did already a very nice introduction of uh, what we do as engineers, so I will keep it very short. Uh, I just want to uh, get the chance to show you a picture from Oslo. So, uh, this is a picture of the built environment. There's a picture of the built environment, and uh, we are engineers, and, and we are somehow dealing uh, with this management of this built environment, the development and the further uh, management of such a built environment. And the built environment contains a lot of uh, 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 
components. So it's roads, bridges, houses, uh, and other infrastructure elements. Mm -hmm. And of course, the decisions we take as engineers, they are supposed to somehow manage this built environment in an optimal way. So I showed this also uh, to my students at the university to underline that, as we can see, the built environment is somehow already there, right? Of course, we will develop it further, it will grow, uh, but the uh, grow rate will be maybe decline a little bit uh, in the future. And now it's more about maintaining the built environment. And when we want to maintain the uh, built environment, there uh, are decisions like, can we extend the lifetime of the structure? Should we rebuild it? Should we repair it? What should we do with the structure? And therefore, we start, as a structural engineering profession, we start to do measurements on this built environment in order to find out what to do. Answering these basic questions from Kant, right? What should we do? What can we know? So that's exactly what we apply uh, to this built environment. And this uh, value of information assessment is actually a very good tool. Also, it's a very ambitious tool to introduce this in engineering because uh, when we want to introduce that, we have to more or less uh, take the entire engineering practice and put it on the other side. Because we have to start with a rather strict representation of our uncertainties, of our mainly simplified uh, modeling of this uh, built environment that does not contain any probability statements normally. Right? So now we have to take our traditional rules to deal with this built environment and extend it that we have a strict and fair and honest representation of uncertainties. That's actually a point. Right? Because normally we do simplified rules, partial factor design, and we don't think too much about uncertainties. But when we want to apply value of information assessment, when we want to apply the pre posteriori analysis, as a starting point, we need a fair representation of all uncertainties of our a priori, a priori assessment of the model. A priori is a word you will uh, hear after, uh, more in this, uh, in this lecture. A priori means before. A priori means before we do a further analysis. Right? Posteriori means afterwards. And pre-posteriori means before but afterwards. So we look, we look what could happen afterwards in order to find out what, what should we do. That's the key to studio. But we will come to that uh, much closer. So we have to deal with this uh, life cycle. We have to deal with uncertainties. That's clear in this life cycle. And uh, of course, the point here is we make decisions under uncertainty as engineers. And our constraints. Uh, Sebastian told you already this objective function that somehow includes uh, some criteria on the safety of personal safety of the environment and economical constraints. So this is uh, the constraints we build uh, our objective function around. So we take an example. Of course, I come from uh, Norway. I have to talk about oil, right? So that's a classical decision problem. We already looked at the decision tree before, but that's a much more simple one. And you know that that's a classical a textbook example where you have a decision <coughs> indicated by the square and you have an event uh, indicated by the circle. So that's always with decision trees. You have decisions indicated by a square. There we have control, right? There we can uh, decide ourselves what we do. And then there's something we don't have any control, we just uh, have to wait what happens, right? And that's a classical uh, example of an oiled wildcatter. You can imagine uh, these people that, uh, that run their businesses, for instance, in Texas, and they have always the decision, should I invest money to drill or should I leave it? And when they drill, in this example, when they drill, uh, they uh, will lose very much simplified, $400,000, say, costs uh, the drilling. And when they get uh, the oil, then they get $1 million back. No, $5 million even, this example. So they get $5 million when they when they get oil. In reality, this is much more complicated. Everything is somehow not discrete. But just to explain this example, this logic, uh, we can uh, construct uh, a decision problem uh, as we are. Then we have this decision tree. And we look what are the consequences of each of these branches of the uh, decision tree. So when we drill and get oil, 
then we get the 5 million, but we have to deduct our investments, 400,000. So uh, we get $4.6 million. When we drill and don't get oil, then we don't get any benefit from the oil, but we have invested 400,000, so it's minus 0 0.4 million. And when we do not, do not drill, then uh, it does not matter whether there's oil or not, because we will never know. Right? <laughs> and now a decision problem is about finding an optimum. Right? So now we have to find what to do. What is the expected benefit of the decision of drilling compared to the expected benefit or the expected cost uh, when we don't drill? So what is the expected cost when we don't drill? Zero. Zero. Right? It's clear. Zero. So that's a good uh, that's a good measure of comparison. So now let's elaborate what happens when we drill. So when we drill, we have either the possibility, if we don't know it beforehand, we have either the possibility to get oil or not to get, not to get oil. So we have to assess the probability, and that's actually our context we are elaborating on probabilities, right? We always look at probabilities when we have to make a decision. So this is also a, a nice principle. We are engineers. We are not in interested in probabilities just for fun. We want to have probabilities because we want to make decisions. Here we need the probability whether there's oil uh, in order to find uh, the, the decision in this problem. So we run around, we ask a geologist about his degree of belief. Uh, maybe we find some, we are lucky and find somebody who is a little bit experienced in that, in that area. And he says, ah, normally I would say, hmm, there's a little slope and things like that, I would say 0 0.1. And then we say, ah, you can look the, the geologist in the face and say, hmm, okay, let's, uh, let's make a calculation, this is 0 0.1. Let's make a calculation, this is 0 0.1. So we have to multiply the, the outcome of drilling and getting oil with 0 0.1. And then we have also to multiply the outcome of uh, drilling and uh, not getting oil uh, with 0 0.9, which is the complementary event of getting oil. Right. And then we do that, and that's the formula here, that's actually the risk, that's the expected consequence. We have the 0 0.1 times uh, 4.6 plus 0 0.9 plus minus, um, times minus 0 0.4, and that gives 0 0.1 which is a positive number, 100,000. So what should we do? Hmm? Drill. But yeah, I mean, uh, suppose we have integrated that. But that's still, that's still it's, a, it's a valid uh, thing to think about because we can say, okay, uh, 0 0.1, 100,000, we drill. But in from out of 10 cases, in nine cases, we make a loss still, right? So what, what, what is this 0 0.1 telling us? The risk is high. It's the risk, but uh, it, it's telling us that when we would do such, such decisions many, many times, then this would be the strategy to go. But if we are uh, new in the business, just graduated from, uh, from college, having maybe a, a big loan from the from the bank, we would not do that, right? Because we would get bankrupt in uh, nine, nine out of 10 cases. So there comes this risk aversion into the field. We don't discuss this. We make normally uh, decisions uh, from the perspective of society. So there we have many, many decisions. And we search for right strategies. So when we search for the <laughs> right strategy, when we, when we search for the right strategy in this case, then of course we would trip. But we could also say, I, don't, I did not like the face of the geologist, I make, a, I make a more advanced analysis. I go to a consultant that makes some tests in the ground and tries to find out whether there's oil or not. And then, this consultant, this is maybe a good idea when we would say the consultant is for free, right? Then there's no, nothing against it. But the consultant is also very expensive. So we don't do that now, that will be Sebastian tomorrow. When we now include the possibility to make further tests of a consultant and we try to integrate the cost of this consultant and we try to formulate or extend the decision problem to a decision whether we have to decide to, uh, to hire a consultant or not, then we talk about a pre-posteriori analysis. 
But just to say that the main point of this, of course, you see a decision tree. We will look at much more decision trees uh, in this course. Uh, but uh, as a principal statement in this very brief introduction to probability theory, for engineers, for our context, the only reason we deal with probabilities is we want to make decisions. Prob probability has not at all any value for us when we look at it isolated. You, if you want, you can challenge me, then we have a discussion. But uh, I, that's, that's, my, that's my opinion. So that's the, that's the questions of Kant. We discussed about them. And then we look at uh, a set theory, just to uh, talk about the same thing. I suppose that 99.9% uh, .9 of you are totally aware of these things. So when we talk about sets, when we talk about uh, uh, outcomes of experiments, then it's very essential to be aware of the definition of the, uh, of the total set. That's the total set, that's the uh, event space uh, where all events uh, happen. In very general, uh, when we look at uh, 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 one-dimensional uh, property, uh, this is minus infinity to plus infinity. But for instance, we also have event spaces uh, for instance, for material properties, for material strengths, then we would say it's rather from zero to, you, to plus infinity. And when we come back, this is actually of some practical importance, when we want to decide which model to, cha to, to choose, which uh, distribution function to choose to represent an uh, event we want to uh, uh, describe with it or represent with it. Uh, then uh, a very good practice is to look first at uh, 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 where is the event space defined of my model and where is it defined uh, of my real property and that should match. That's a very good practice. Then we have some uh, events or some uh, combinations of events we are, we are very often interested in and uh, we will also look when we now look at some uh, uh, definitions on, on probability. So uh, here the square is still an uh, event space. This is, this is the area where everything takes place. And uh, then we have some uh, events in this uh, event space. Here we have event uh, E1, E2, and E3. And uh, we can talk about uh, uh, the union of, uh, of an event. That is, for instance, uh, this plus this is a union of an event. Uh, then we have a, uh, then we have an intersection of an event. This is this uh, little darker uh, blue area where the the two events intersect. And then here we can also define the the empty set. The empty set is defined as something that is not existing. <coughs> so, for instance, here we don't have an intersection between uh, event uh, two and three. We talked about this. Uh, different interpretations of uh, uh, probability. Uh, very important, uh, you uh, have, might have noticed that these interpretations are quite different uh, from each other. Uh, but uh, the calculus, the math uh, of uh, probability, they apply independent of the interpretation of probability. This is, of course, very nice. So let's come to these rules. Uh, the probability is defined by or the calculus and how to handle this probabilities is defined by these axioms. You have uh, seen them. Uh, they are from who? Who did write down this? Kolmogorov Smirnov, right? So this was a uh, publication from 1924. So who is Greek? The Greeks did not talk about probability too much. Right, they did very, very much uh, elaborated things in math already, but probability is a phenomena that was not discussed in ancient times. So that's interesting, uh, and that's also uh, maybe related to the fact that probability is somehow a strange animal to us. Right? So the entire probability theory de developed uh, comparably late, and uh, if you if you think that uh, the fact that uh, probability is a number between zero and one was somehow uh, postulated only less than uh, 100 years ago, that's actually surprising, right? So these concepts are uh, relatively, relatively uh, new. So what does this axiom say? First of all, a probability, which is uh, abbreviated by PR of an event A, in brackets A, is always uh, larger or equal than zero. 
So we have non-negative probabilities, that's important. And then we said also the other boundary, we say that the probability of a certain event is one. So the first two <coughs> axioms, okay, probability and number between zero and one. And then we have the third one that says that uh, infinitive sequence of the disjoint events, disjoint means that uh, these are events which have not an intersection, uh, can be computed by the sum of the individual probabilities. That also sounds uh, straightforward, but that's an important rule uh, to, uh, to agree on. And these three axioms, they <laughs> allow to explore a little bit on the following properties of uh, probability. Very briefly, you have this also in your script. Probability of an empty set is zero. Uh, then also the probability of a, of a finite set of disjoint events is also the sum of those. Uh, then uh, uh, we have uh, the probability of a, a complementary event of an event is one minus this event. So for instance, the, we have the probability of failure. And then what is the probability that we have survival? It's one minus the probability of failure. Right? And uh, yeah, then we have some other rules, uh, maybe this is also important, the last one. So the uh, probability of a uh, union of two events is the uh, sum of the individual probabilities uh, minus the probability of the, uh, of the intersection. This can be uh, agreed on uh, very nicely when we look at the Venn diagram, this situation. We might have uh, two events, A and B. And we have the event space, uh, event space here. So uh, the, the union of these events, so we want to know this here. Is this event plus, or the probability of this event plus the probability of this event. And then we have to subtract one time this one. So this is what we do, right? this is the intersection. But uh, the intersection is very tricky. We will look at that when we talk about independence. So only when it's independent, we can uh, make a very easy rule and can just say the intersection of two events is the multiplication of the corresponding probabilities. Uh, but this is only possible when these uh, events are independent. So, uh, very important to us and very important in this course is the definition of a conditional probability. And uh, actually when we use probabilities in engineering decision making, it would be fair to state that uh, next to all our probabilities are conditional. When we uh, uh, take the uh, Bayesian interpretation of uh, probability theories, then we can always say, okay, it's conditional on us. Huh? So everything we do is conditional. We have to have a, 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 clear, full, a clear view what uh, is a conditional uh, probability, probability. The conditional probability of an event A, after we learn that event B has occurred, that's actually what it is. So that's the condition on uh, event B has occurred. Can be defined as uh, probability of A conditional on B is equal to the probability of A intersected with B divided by the probability of B. So we, in a way, normalize by the probability of B. So if you look at this uh, Venn di diagram again, so now we are looking, maybe I'll make a new one, it looks exactly the same, but I make some other scribbles inside. So we have again this A and B. So now the conditional probability of A given B. So we consider not only not the entire event space anymore, but we restrict ourselves on B. And then we look at the uh, probability that A occurs given that B has occurred. So we don't look at the uh, uh, entire event space anymore. Now we only look at this B. 
And geometrically, we would look at the intersection, because that's the only place where we have A and B, right? And we normalize it by the probability of B. So this is happens in this formula. So we have only B, that's our condition, and then we look what is the probability of A given B. So that's the definition of the conditional probability. And when we look at this conditional probability, and we look at uh, a so-called uh, commutative property of multiplication, that's something you learned already in primary school, that uh, A times B is equal to B times A. The same holds for this uh, intersection operator. So A intersected with B is equal to B intersected with A. And when we use these two properties, then we might agree uh, on, on this formula. So we had, uh, we had the probability of A given B equal to the probability of A intersected with B divided by the probability of B. So now when we get this on that side, then we have the probability of A B times the probability of B is equal to the probability of A and B. So if you use this and we turn around A and B, then we can write down uh, that the probability of B times the probability of A conditional on B is equal to the probability of A given the probability of B conditional on A. Well, that sounds trivial, but it's very important for uh, the development of the next rule that we do, which is the Bayesian rule. But before we have that, I introduce the uh, uh, total probability theorem. We will also uh, employ that for uh, mo mostly continuous variables in this course, but for, uh, for discrete uh, events. This uh, total probability theorem says when we have an event space, no, not indicated by omega, but by S, sorry for that. So that's the event space. And we uh, have some disjoint events in this event space. It's called B. In this, in this figure, it's B1 to B7. That's some disjoint uh, events that fill out the entire uh, event space. And then we have another event A. And now we have uh, two different possibilities to express the probability of A. Either we know it, either we know the probability of A, then we don't have to make any fancy stuff, or we can express the probability of A as the sum of the probability of A conditional <coughs> on all these Bs times the probability of B. So it's actually the the sum of all these little segments here. And that's the total probability theory. And uh, here we make a little example. We make an example. A practical example, without any dice, without any coins, with structures. So let's suppose we have 50% uh, concrete structures. Thirty percent steel structures. And twenty percent timber structures. So now we know the probability of failure of a concrete structure. Probability of failure, failure concrete is equal to zero point. 
0,2. That's not uh, based on my experience, that's just a number. That is not too small. So that you can calculate with it. Then we have the probability of uh, steel structures, failure of steel structures. Steel structures. Zero point zero three. I like to have fights with steel people. <laughs> and uh, the probability of timber, the probability of failure of timber structures. is 0 0.025, just some numbers, right? But now, what is the probability of failure of a structure? Please, go ahead. You are uh, welcome to use your calculator. Anybody has an idea? Fine. 2.4%. 0.030. That's at least possible, I trust you. Must be something in between, right? So we don't challenge that. But can you explain how we did calculate it? Can you briefly explain how we calculate The probability of failure multiplied by the probability of having that kind of structure, yes. which is uh, 0 0.5 uh -huh. or 0 0.5, yeah. plus uh, probability of failure of uh, yeah. steel yeah. multiplied by. Yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, it's like calculating a weighted mean, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it feels OK, right? And this is nothing else that is uh, that is in this total probability theory. You can apply it for much more complicated things, but in the end, it boils down to be uh, something that can also be, be described as a, as a weighted mean. So this uh, uh, total probability theorem, we will also, uh, in the end of this lecture, I will present a continuous form for continuous variables. And this uh, you can use after you have uh, learned from John Sörensen how to do data analysis. Uh, this you can use to integrate out the uncertainties of your parameter estimation and to develop uh, a so-called predictive and unconditional uh, distribution of a property. So that's very important for us. But it's also very important uh, to... Uh, let me do this first. It's also very important uh, to uh, uh, deduct and to understand uh, Bayes' rule. Right? The space rule is uh, actually utilizing the total probability theory. You can see the total, uh, so you, you define a, a conditional uh, probability of an event B given A by the probability A intersected with B. So this is nothing new, right? This is just the definition of a, uh, of a, a conditional probability divided by probability of A. Now, normally it's tricky to compute uh, these probability of A directly, so we can uh, use, make use of the total probability theory to replace uh, the term uh, below the line. And uh, here we make use about uh, this uh, multiplication rule uh, for conditional probabilities uh, uh, using this uh, commutative law uh, we have seen two slides before. And then we can uh, formulate a base uh, theory and uh, I think now it's uh, time to make an example for you that you really understand uh, what this space uh, theory means. So let's look at, uh, at the practical example. How are we time-wise, Sebastian? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Good. So <coughs> we will look at an example. And I will take this opportunity to uh, introduce to you a so-called live script. It is directly MATLAB. I have produced this uh, more or less notes, very, very condensed notes, uh, or, uh, in a, a so-called live script. And this contains text, as you see here. And this also contains uh, uh, some, some basic uh, operations you can do in uh, MATLAB. 
And you can imagine for this uh, very basic uh, probability theorem, these uh, MATLAB scripts are very uh, uh, humble. But they're not very uh, uh, complex. Uh, but uh, tomorrow when we do the form, it will be very handy for you to have already uh, a MATLAB script uh, at hand for, for all these algorithms. So now we had this base rule, and uh, I suppose uh, at least half of you have heard it, and, uh, but many of you maybe don't exactly remember uh, how it works. So let's look at a practical example. Uh, and the practical example starts actually not at base rule, it starts at the establishment of uh, conditional probability based on data. So let's imagine uh, a rather uh, a, a modern academical example. Let's imagine we are working in a company and we are developing a new device for detecting corrosion in concrete. Right? Con namely, corrosion of the con concrete reinforcement bars. So we have a non-destructive device we can hold on the surface somehow. And by that, we can detect whether there is corrosion initiated at the corrosion bar, at the reinforcement bus or not. And you can imagine that such a device is, of course, very nice to have. But you also know that the information that uh, comes from such a device is not perfect. Right? So we might get an indication, and there's no corrosion. And we might get an indication uh, or we might get no indication and there is corrosion. So there is some uh, room for uh, imperfection and normally uh, uh, these, these devices are not uh, perfect at all. So now we want to uh, bring this uh, detection device uh, on the market. So we make a big uh, experimental campaign, like a big experimental campaign where we have many, uh, where we have many specimen, concrete specimen, and we all measure them whether we can detect or not uh, a corrosion initiation with our device. And afterwards, we uh, destroy this, uh, this specimen and look whether there was real corrosion or not. Right? So we can uh, we have data. And uh, we have uh, the event of uh, corrosion and no corrosion. And we have the event of indication of corrosion and no indication of corrosion. So this is the events we can have, right? So now we have data and we actually uh, are very lucky because we have many data. And we can make, for instance, observations on uh, 278 where we indicate corrosion and afterwards we, uh, we really find corrosion, right? Then we have uh, 60, uh, 36 observations where we don't indicate corrosion, but there was corrosion. Right? It's maybe a realistic, uh, more or less realistic set. Then we have the case where we have indicated corrosion, but we don't find corrosion. And then we have uh, the case where we have not indicated corrosion and don't find corrosion. So now we can uh, <coughs> elaborate a little bit on the probabilities. So first of all, we can uh, say that uh, we have uh, some sums. So we, have, we can count the sum of all observations that have uh, indicated corrosion, and we can sum up uh, all observations that have indicated uh, uh, no corrosion. And we can sum up all events that uh, are corroded, or all specimens that are corroded, and all uh, specimens that are not corroded. So now we want to find out the probability that we get an indication of corrosion, given there was corrosion. How do we do that, based on that data? So we 
remember the, how the uh, conditional probability was defined? It was the probability of the intersection of the two events. So what is the intersection of the two events we are interested here? So it's what it is, it is uh, indication of corrosion and corrosion. What is the intersection of that? Which number in the table? That's the intersection, right? So we take this value. And we divide it by what? By the probability of corrosion? By the sum. 314. And this is? That's the probability of indication of corrosion given growth. That is somehow a descriptor of the precision of our of our uh, of our device. So we can deduct now from this conditional probability. We have to believe, we have to uh, remember that conditional probabilities in principle behave the same as normal probabilities of as, as, as non-conditional ones. So. We can deduct directly from this number what is the probability of having no indication given corrosion, which is one minus this number. Yeah. But when, what we cannot deduct from this, uh, from this is actually the probability that is uh, conditional on a different event. So it's, for instance, the probability of indication of corrosion given there was no corrosion. No. Yeah. So this is something we don't get out from this number, right? This is something we have to look back in the table. So first we look at the intersection again. So in the intersection of these is uh, 72. And then we have the sum, which is uh, 340, I guess. And then this gives. So that's the other one, right? These are the two numbers we can use. And of course, we, when we know these numbers, we also need to uh, know the numbers of the comp uh, complementary event. Right? So now we can uh, write this in our description for our new device, and we can set it. <laughs> now you can be critic, OK, there's a statistical uncertainty and things like that. But let's forget about this. Let's uh, take this as best estimates and some uh, val valuable uh, indications about the uh, information content we can reach with our measurement device. And then we also go to our boss and say, ah, these numbers, they are, they are really good. Yeah. It's a good device. And actually, when you compare it with practical used uh, devices, maybe this is even very good. Right? So now let's take these values in mind. So this was uh, development of conditional probabilities based uh, on some data. And of course, we could also uh, develop the probability of corrosion given indication of corrosion based on this data. But this is not very interesting because this data set where we had so many corroded specimen is obviously taken from some domain of structures where we have already severe corrosion, right? So when we would have this fraction between corrosion and no corrosion in a, in a structure, this would be very bad. So the, the inference of this on based on this data on the on the conditional probability of having corrosion given indication makes no sense. Hmm? But in a practical situation, we might go to a bridge. We might go to a bridge, and of course this bridge is a nice bridge. Huh? It's uh, uh, maybe ten years in service, and we don't have we have a little bit we are a little bit afraid about corrosion. But we say maybe the corrosion probability and that bridge is maybe 10%. But this is, of course, nothing we do uh, just by looking at it. This is something we integrate uh, some of the information we have. And we come to a conclusion. Maybe we have experience with 10-year-old bridges. Uh, and normally, there is not such a high risk of having corrosion in such bridges. Uh, so we can say, yeah, this is 0.1%. Uh, so we have an a priori, an a priori opinion. 
on the probability of corrosion of this bridge. But with this a priori, uh, uh, or with this, with this a priori view on that probability, we might reach some uh, threshold in our organizatorical system of the uh, national or federal road ad or administration that from this a priori uh, probability, we have to make an assessment. So we make an assessment on this bridge because we uh, think that this 0 0.1 is maybe too high. Right? And then we make measurements. And we make measurements uh, with our brand new indication tool we have just bought that has these properties we just uh, developed, right? So we make a non-destructive measurement and we get the result. Corrosion indicated with our measurement device. So what is now the probability that we have corrosion given we have this measurement result. So that's that's the big question, the practically relevant question. So we did know the probability of corrosion a priori, unconditional on our measurement. But now we want to know this. Right? And this we can actually solve using the base theory. So we can look at the probability when you look uh, back to the slides. And look at the probability of corrosion indicated, initiated, or indicated given corrosion times the probability of corrosion. And this part of the this part of the uh, formula actually contains all information. And this probability is already linear dependent on that one, it's proportional. So what we write here is just a normalization constant. So very often in practical pro problems that are much more complicated than that one, it's a little bit hard to solve an integral here. Now it's only a sum. And then we only have to get sure that uh, we get a probability density or a probability and not a likelihood. Right? So here we look at the sum of the probability of corrosion Indicated given corrosion. So it's really hard to see. Can you write with big letters? <coughs> so I can't really see. <laughs> yeah, no, we really cannot see. Yeah. <laughs> Good. We will manage. I write it first and then you can see. Okay. And the probability of corrosion indication. No corrosion. So what we see here is that we have to, I also talk now, you have to listen. It's the probability of corrosion, given corrosion indicated, is equal to the probability of corrosion indicated, given corrosion, times the probability of corrosion. That's the information content we have. And then we have to divide that by the sum so it's the probability of corrosion indication given corrosion, actually the same than, than above here, times the probability of corrosion plus the probability of corrosion initiation given no corrosion times the probability of no corrosion. That's the rule of base applied to this example. <laughs> and now we have to remember the number 0 0.88 and uh, 0 0.2. One, right? So we can write some numbers here. So we have the probability of uh, corrosion initiated, 0 point, 0 0.88 times 0 0.1. That was the a priori probability. Divided by 0 0.88 times 0 0.1. Exactly the same. Plus 
Now we have the probability of uh, corrosion initiation given no corrosion. But we don't have to look at that. Zero point twenty one. Times the probability of having no correction is zero point nine. That's the very important number of this formula actually. This 0 0.9 triggers everything. Because what we observe, please calculate this for me. 0 0.32. Yeah. What we observe is that we are maybe a little bit disappointed about our, uh, about our confidence we now have that there is corrosion. <coughs> Even we get our very expensive measurement device and get an indication of corrosion, we only get a probability that there is really corrosion of 0 0.32, which is lower than 0 0.5. Right? And intuitively, this is uh, disappointing for us. Right? And that has to do with the following effects, and that's actually characteristic for our engineering problem. We have a relatively unlikely event. And in practical applications, these numbers are even smaller. And this number of the unlikely event, this low number, is triggering this here, which is above the line. But it's also triggering what is below the line, which becomes a very big number then, when this becomes low. Right? So if we replace this with 0 0.01, then we get an even worse result, even more disappointing result. So as a, as a rule for your fingertips, when, you have, when we have a very uncertain phenomena we want to get information about, we have to have a very, very accurate measurement device. Otherwise, we don't add a lot of information to it. So otherwise, so we can add the uncertainty of the device in the, uh, in the problem with the yeah, this, is now, this is now already integrated, right? This, this probability statement, that's interesting. This is just a statement that includes our uncertainty about the problem, our uncertainty about the assessment whether there is corrosion or not. So we did not talk about that too much. Uh, so we're supposed to end in at 12 o'clock. Are we supposed to end at 12 o'clock? Uh, yes. Yeah. No, it's no problem. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 the things that follow there are more classical uh, things about distribution functions and things like that. So let's, let, me, let, let us take five minutes on what is this uncertainty we are talking about. Because this should be mentioned at least once before we uh, come with more advanced methods. So what we want to uh, represent by our probabilities now we talk about probabilities of events, right? But we, later on we will talk about probabilistic models, probabilistic functions. What we want to express by this is uh, our uncertainty. And the uncertainty has uh, two uh, important uh, contributors. One is randomness. And the other one is lack of knowledge. And lack of knowledge is uh, the very important one. Lack of knowledge is the one uh, we want to address with our methodologies. The lack of knowledge is the one we want to address with this Bayesian rule. This is something we can reduce. So we always have to be aware about the part of the uncertainty in our problem that can be reduced. This is something we can uh, somehow attack by structural health monitoring, for instance. And there's also another part that cannot be reduced. And this is uh, generally uh, referred to as uh, epistemic uncertainty, the Greek. Yeah? It has to do with knowledge. Epistemia. What is it? Science. Yeah. Epistemia. Yeah. Okay, this is uh, attributed to our knowledge. And the other one is aleatory. And that is to the die, right? It's we throw a die. And the die can actually be used uh, to make a, a very good demonstration of the difference. 
So now I have a die in my hands. Normally, I refuse to have these die examples in the prob probability class because this is what everybody does. Huh? But now I have a die in my hand. And I ask you, what is the probability that I will throw a 6? Well, 1 over 6. Yeah. And now I throw the die. Yeah. So what is the probability I have a 6? About you or us? No, what is, you do you, what is the probability that I have you a 6? You know now what is that? No, you don't know. I know it. You know. Yeah, you don't know. That is the 1 over 6, right? It's the same. Yeah. For you, it's the same. You, but for you, it's not. Yeah, it depends what you know. So you still don't know. But now... This probability is a statement of epistemic uncertainty for you. Yes. And before it was a statement of aleatoric uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this character of aleatoric or epistemic changes over time. Mm -hmm. When we design a structure, now I go, go back uh, to, to real problems again. When we design a structure, we design a beam, right? And we, we somehow uh, think about some properties of this beam that are relevant for our design, for instance, the bending strength, huh? or the yield strength, this beam. And then we make our analysis, and then, of course, uh, the, and the uncertainty, the scatter of this material property, before we design it, the material, we don't know where it comes from, it will be delivered somewhere from China, is a pure aleatoric uncertainty, because we, should, we, 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 we don't know. And then once the structure is implemented, the beam is there, we could test it, normally we don't do, but then the uncertainty becomes epistemic because it has realized. As the throw of the die has realized, after some things are realized, they become epistemic and we can test them. And therefore, normally, the reduction of uncertainties is always an option or should be an option considered when it comes to the assessment of existing structures because for existing structures, many of the uncertainties become observable, become detectable, and uh, they can potentially be reduced. So that's, a, that's an important uh, principle when we talk about uh, uh, uncertainty. And, uh, a probability and also a probability distribution function I will very briefly talk about uh, before we have uh, lunch. Uh, this is always a statement of our uncertainty and it contains both parts of uncertainty. But what we want to reduce is always the epistemic part of uncertainty. So... Uh, So long we have talked about events, and uh, just in the end, and you can also uh, read it in the script, of course, we have to introduce uh, functions, functions uh, that normally are defined on a, on a physical uh, dimension, on a physical uh, scale. For instance, we can talk about the variable x here, and this x could represent uh, the yearly maximum wind speed. It can represent uh, yield strength of steel. It can re represent everything. And we all agree that uh, we have a physical variable that can happen. It can happen on this uh, <coughs> continuous uh, line, so to say. And now we define something that is called a probability density function. That's what we will use. That is what John Zernsen will use now in his uh, lecture. And that probability density function is a probability rule that is somehow uh, representing the probability distribution of this variable. So for instance, take the steel yield uh, capacity. We now can indicate with a function where possible outcomes or possible realizations of this variable will be. Right? So uh, linking to uh, uh, Sebastian's uh, considerations, we can have observations on this, on this axis of data. And then this curve is actually indicating the density of data we can have on this line. So this is how you can visualize this. And this is uh, generally referred to as the probability density function. This is written like, like this here. We have a small letter, here we have a capital letter. And in very general terms, we should always consider this probability density function. <coughs> uh, 
as a conditional density function. Because it's conditional, at least, <laughs> it's conditional on its parameters. So these are the parameters of the distribution. And uh, the inference you will uh, learn now after lunch is actually uh, associated to uh, finding estimates for these parameters, parameter estimation. And uh, you will learn that uh, we can never know these parameters exactly. Parameter of a normal distribution, for instance, the mean and the standard deviation. For a uniform distribution, it's the upper and, uh, and, and, and lower limit. Right. This is the parameter of a uh, distribution function. And we can never know them exactly from a philosophical point of view. Because we, will we want to always represent a, a, a full population of things based on some data, based on, on finance uh, observations. So we have to uh, consider these uncertainties in the parameters as well. And now I have to bring this because it's so central. So uh, suppose that we make uh, an assessment based on data, and then we find out that we uh, cannot uh, estimate these uh, parameters exactly. This is what we will find out. And suppose that we can uh, express the uncertainty about the parameters also with a density function. So we consider them also distributed. It sounds totally crazy, right? But we do that. So we have actually two random variables in this. In the, in this. We have the variable of interest, that's our material strings, and we have the parameters of the distribution function. And what we, what we now want to do is we don't want to set up a confidence interval where our parameters lie, because this confidence interval, you can imagine, it's very cumbers, it's very awkward to use in a decision problem. So confidence intervals, everybody has heard about it, but. Uh, this can actually only be of use in when we want to describe the uncertainties somehow and we want to classify them. But when we want to do something that is essential for engineering, predicting things, then we need the so-called predictive distribution. And the predictive distribution is actually the unconditional version of this. That will be my last formula of today. That's the unconditional version of this. And there, we, of course, have to do something with the uh, uh, uncertainty of the, of the parameters. And what we do is we integrate the parameters out. So we integrate over theta, over all thetas. And we have the conditional distribution of x. And we integrate, or yeah, in the script I have written <coughs> not the f but the p, but it's the same. We integrate over all parameters. And this sounds uh, fancy, but it's uh, it's uh, more or less a convolution integral, right? And it's um, in the end also the same what we have seen uh, with this total probability theory, right? And such an integration. This afternoon, uh, maybe you, sh you should uh, try to implement in MATLAB. So now, in the next in the next lecture, you will learn how to make uh, uh, estimates, point estimates based on data. Then we will get out the distribution of the uh, uh, the distribution of the distribution parameters, and uh, then uh, maybe in the afternoon I can help you to set up an integral, how to find out this predictive uh, distribution. So that's the predictive. <coughs> so that's a very important tool for engineering decision making because it considers the uncertainties consistently. And what I meant in the be begin beginning, the practical, uh, the practical issue for uh, very often for uh, the value of information analysis is that we have a, a strict 
representation of uncertainties of our prior situation. The prior situation very often evolves from uh, traditional engineering reasoning, and that has normally nothing to do with this uh, strict uh, representation of uncertainties. So uh, for our case studies, for our further procedure, I think the first challenge is to get the current situation of a, of a, situa of a, of a problem and formulate it as strict uh, that we have a fair and a complete representation of uncertainties. And then, of course, we can elaborate the effects of reducing these uncertainties. So are there any questions so far? So as I said, uh, uh, Sebastian will or has already sent you a link to a zip folder. In the zip folder, I'm afraid uh, you will uh, see something that has to do with Mac OS. But you have to click on that folder. And then it should be at least possible to open the PDF. And there is also an MLX, that's a live script for MATLAB. Mm -hmm. And that you can import uh, on, the, uh, on the root of your uh, MATLAB program. And you can read it in MATLAB. And there you can also execute some uh, simple programs. And the uh, content of that script goes uh, kind of beyond what I have told you today. So it's actually not meant to give you a full overview in one and a half hours about this topic. But it's meant that you read through this live script. And also, if you are interested, uh, look at literature. I also have attached some PDFs of literature. Uh, and it's all you're also supposed to ask me in the afternoon uh, about uh, particular things you, you are wondering about. Um, yeah. send the email again. In which email? You send the email later. Yeah. After the lecture now. Yeah. Good. Yes, I'm sorry for the problems I had in the beginning. This was too advanced uh, computer tools involved. That's always not good. So thanks so far, and have a nice lunch. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you for your attention? So what you see here is the, what you see when you open MATLAB. Who, uh, who of you has opened uh, MATLAB uh, at least once in his life? <laughs> so everybody is aware of it, you too? OK, some not. No problem. It's, uh, MATLAB is a, it's a, it's a tool you can make calculations, right? It's not a programming language. It's a so-called script language. So it's do, it does things in a very convenient and easy way. So that's actually exactly uh, what we need uh, as engineers when we come, uh, want to come to fast and dirty solutions. Right? Uh, but you can also uh, do rather advanced stuff uh, with MATLAB, but uh, you can somehow skip the, the formal programming uh, hassles you normally have to do when you use uh, C++ or Fortran or other languages. So what I, so what I did, I did produce for you uh, a little script. Um, and uh, this script mainly contains uh, of text. Actually, it's um, not a perfect tool to write a, script, a text in a MATLAB uh, script. Uh, but uh, especially tomorrow, we will see that it will be very convenient to have the text that introduces, it, that introduces the background of something and the corresponding program that computes this or uh, examines the theory is actually a convenient one. So I will send you this file and you can open it in, uh, in MATLAB and then you can scroll down and then you see uh, some text and you see some uh, formulas and you see some examples. And here, for instance, is the example uh, we looked at. You don't have to read every word by word, but this is the example we looked at uh, for this uh, corrosion uh, problem, where we had the data and where we had to find out the conditional probabilities that we, that we get these observations. And here you see uh, the corresponding uh, MATLAB file uh, with the data, maybe hard to read, 278 uh, observations that we have an indication uh, and uh, corrosion and so forth. And then you have uh, the calculations that have taken place. So uh, this afternoon you are asked to look at these examples and uh, understand them. Right? And when you don't understand them, we ask. Uh, then there are some examples uh, where I also produced some, some pictures. So this is an example with this concrete and steel structures with a total probability theory. Um, this is an example on the base uh, with this uh, a concrete uh, example continued. 
Uh, it's not very spectacular. It will be much more handy when we have to do more advanced calculations. But also for those of you not having any background in MATLAB, it's maybe a very nice start uh, that you see how to calculate things. And here we start uh, introducing something I was not so much talking about. And uh, that's the first uh, probability distribution. So what we have here, uh, for those that cannot read, I, I, I read it for you. It's an f from a variable set, that's our random variable. And that has a distribution that it's p when set is equal to 1, and 1 minus p when set is equal to 0. So who knows what is the name of such a distribution? It's so easy that you maybe have even forgot it. It's a binom binomial distribution. That's actually the, a very basic distribution for, uh, uh, for Bonulli experiments, where we have an outcome that is a success or a failure. And this uh, distribution we can use uh, for uh, many things. I just introduced it here as a probability distribution, meaning that we can have a function that distributes probabilities to uh, certain events. And in this uh, case, we have an event of uh, set equal to 1 or on set equal to 0. And we attribute uh, probabilities to these events. <coughs> then, uh, as a next, uh, and I, I attached uh, this distribution to an example uh, where we have uh, a mass production of mechanical parts. And uh, we know that the probability that uh, such a mass-produced uh, mechanical part is defective is 0 0.1, just to name a number. And then we can have a probability distribution <coughs> that is pretty straightforward, which looks like this. So for set equal to 0, that means failure. We have a probability of 1, and set equal to 1, uh, that is uh, the probability of 0 0.9. And now, this might uh, appear very, very basic for you, but uh, now we can elaborate on the fact that we have probability distributions for many different uh, purposes uh, for our engineering uncertainty modeling. And that uh, uh, um, very many times we find some um, logical arguments uh, that this probability distribution should look like that. Right? Uh, actually, we, uh, for many probability distributions, we can use the, the classical interpretation of probability in order to derive them. So we can, without making any experiments, come up uh, with, a, with a solution that appears to us as a good suggestion for our probability distribution. And that's actually interesting to learn. So this uh, probability distributions that we also use to represent a little bit more uh, relevant and a little bit more advanced uh, aspects in our daily life engineering decision making, these probability distributions, they come from somewhere. They have a certain logic and they should be applied for certain things. right? And now, making a long sh uh, story short, uh, we go to this mechanical parts again. So we have a mass producing or pro production of mechanical parts, and we know that uh, uh, probability that we have a defective part is 0 0.1. That would be, for instance, the result from a large experimental campaign uh, where we uh, test uh, 1 million parts and find that one-tenth of these parts is defective, right? Maybe 100,000. And then we might conclude that this is the probability, and then uh, we draw uh, a new uh, uh, mechanical parts from this mass production, and we consider that the drawing is somehow uh, a fair, so we don't have any dependency in this drawing. So any draw is entirely random. And then we are interested uh, how many defective parts do we get out from 10 draws? What would you say? Now your spontaneous reaction is one. 
But this is true. Could it be two? Could it be three? Could it be zero? Yes or no? It could, right? So we have to elaborate a little bit on that. So let's have this situation. We uh, take 10 out of this mass production. So what is the probability? Now we have a new variable, x. And x means the number of defective parts out of 10. What is the probability that x is 0? Given independent drawing. This is something you manage. What is it? Pun? No, you make it ten times. So what is the probability that you that you get a non-defective part when you draw it one time? Zero point nine. And the second time you draw, it's again zero point nine. Right. And what is? Yeah. But why? Explain for all. When they are independent, and we draw every every draw we do, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, and then we have the situation in the end when we want to have zero defective parts, that we have an intersection of events, namely the intersection of the event that we did not get a defective part of the first one, and we did not get a part on the second one, and so forth. So it's 0 0.9 by the power of 10. Hmm? So if uh, the probability to get one uh, defective part is p, then we say p minus 1, uh, sorry, 1 minus p by the power of 10, right? So a sloppy representation here on the board, you have the full text in the, in the script. So what is the probability of getting x equal to 10. What is the probability of getting x equal to uh, x equal to 10? That means any part we, 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 we draw is uh, defective. 0 0.1 yeah. Must be a very, very small number, right? Yes. P by the power of 10. Right? So we all agree on that. Now we go, go a little bit more interesting. What is the probability that we have, say, x equal to 3? Yes? The binomial name? No, 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 you know too much. But just say, what, what, how, would you, <laughs> how would you first uh, approach this? I mean, you can uh, do a tree and, uh, mm -hmm. and see how fast there is. Mm -hmm. Where you have uh, three successes, mm -hmm. and so that's three among ten successes. Mm -hmm. And so when you are calculating each of these tests, you have uh, p uh, powers uh, p power three and one minus p power seven. When the, the product p. Uh, okay, he's right, of course. Uh, but let's me, let's keep it simple. So let's talk about uh, probability of. One possibility that we get three, that we get three uh, failures, and one possibility is that the first one, the first three one, are defective, and the next seven one are non-defective. You can imagine like that. It's one possibility, right? So we say that uh, we have the first three one, p equal to uh, by the power of x times. 1 minus p by the power of 10 minus x. That would be the probability of having exactly the first three defective and the next seven non-defective. One possibility. And we have to multiply this by the number of possibilities we get 3 out of 10. Right? And the number of possibilities to get 3 out of 10, that's 10 over 3, this is the nominal thing we uh, remember from our, maybe it was the secondary school. Hmm? 
Let's yeah, now I wrote three, but uh, I'm sorry, after lunch, very sloppy. So here only with numbers. But we see that <coughs> x, this is actually our, our parameter. So we can express something like that for all kinds of x's. So the general form is probability of x 10 over x p by the power of x 1 minus p 10 minus x. So that's the probability distribution, that's the probability function of a discrete variable, which is the number of defective, part, defective parts out of 10 draws. This you can see implemented here. So here is a much more pedagogic uh, representation of this example. And here is the corresponding script. And then we have a probability function uh, for this discrete variable, uh, where we have here the, uh, the number of, of, uh, of uh, defective parts. That's the number of observed defective parts out of uh, 10 draws. So that's the, <coughs> that's the binomial uh, distribution. The other one was the Bernoulli. And we see that uh, the deduction of this uh, probability function was entirely based on the classical interpretation of probability. We did use symmetry, we, we did use logic, we, use, we did use an assumption that was actually an assumption of symmetry, uh, or at least uh, uh, connected to that, that the draws are independent. Right? Therefore, we could, multiply, we could multiply the probabilities. But we used this logic and we found a reasonable uh, representation of this phenomena. <coughs> And in the same way, we can uh, find uh, distributions uh, uh, for uh, different phenomena uh, that we want to physically represent in our engineering problems. For instance, the normal distribution stems from the central limit theory. Everything we, which is a sum of, big, or, uh, uh, of a big number of uh, uh, random uh, events that sum up, and none of these events uh, dominates the others, and the events are also not correlated to each other, that uh, boils down to a normal distribution. So in an engineering problem, when we have the self-weight of a structure consisting of several parts, installations, materials, furniture, that all sum up together, none of them is dominating the sum, we could uh, claim that the normal distribution is maybe a very good model for the weight of the of a structure, for instance. Who can challenge that? What did I tell you in the beginning about event spaces? Louder, please. That's that's one way to challenge. Uh, that, that it's not frequentistic to do so. Uh, but when we use the normal distribution to represent self-weight, we might challenge that assumption because the self-weight is defined on a, uh, on, a, on a scale from zero bis infinity on a domain, and the normal distribution is defined from minus infinity to plus infinity. So especially if you have a large scatter in a property, uh, the use of the normal distribution is very critical. Because when we, for instance, run simulations, then we get uh, a finite uh, probability to get negative uh, realizations of a, of a property that cannot be negative. Right? So the weight of a structure cannot be negative. We agree on that. The same holds for the material strengths uh, uh, or the yield strengths of, of, of steel. So it's always very important, uh, besides uh, looking at the data and besides uh, doing the inference, we will uh, soon be uh, introduced by John. We should never forget that we should have some logical reasons and some, uh, some uh, rational reasons uh, to choose a distribution function uh, to represent uh, a property. Just an example, it was uh, uh, highly discussed uh, how to represent uh, 
uh, the extreme values of a wind speed recently in our community. And then uh, it was uh, advocated that the data uh, that is available fits very nicely to a three parameter log normal distribution. And that, that's actually the way to go. It fits much better uh, than to other distributions that have actually uh, a meaning for somehow extreme value statistics. And that's actually true. On the other hand, it's also uh, not very uh, hard to beat a two-parameter distribution with a three-parameter distribution because you have an additional degree of freedom to, uh, to, to fit to your data. Uh, but on the other hand, when you want to extrapolate on, on such a model, and that's what we do, especially when we look at extreme events and the modeling of, of these extreme events, then it's very important that we have a, a physical foundation and a physical uh, assumption that somehow uh, builds the foundation for this and builds also the foundation for the uh, extrapolation. So, uh, are you ready? Yes. With this, I would conclude <laughs> and uh, steal not much more time from John. So he will give uh, you now some practical tools uh, and I hope we can uh, try them out uh, later on today uh, when we do this interactive uh, part of the lecture. So thanks uh, for now.